Good evening. I am Sally Shortall, a professor in the university and co-chair of the Public Insights Committee. Welcome to tonight's uh, lecture, which I think is very popular. It's going to be given by the 12th Duke of Northumberland, Rafe Percy, and it's titled The Percy's Annick Castle and a Thousand Years of History. I will be back after uh, the lecture for a live question and answer with the Duke of Northumberland. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so in the Dropbox function on your YouTube screen, or you can tweet us at InsightsNCL. If you want to tweet about the uh, lecture, please use hashtag InsightsNCL. So I will see you later. Enjoy the lecture. And here to more formally introduce the Duke of Northumberland is Professor Anya Hurlbert. It is a pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Rafe Percy, the 12th Duke of Northumberland. Rafe is the current head of a family that has shaped British history for over a thousand years, losing several heads along the way. And he is here to tell us that dramatic story. So my role is to tell you a little of his own story. Rafe is an historian, businessman, sportsman, philanthropist, photographer, and writer. He wears his learning as lightly as he bounds across the tennis court or leaps up hills. He was born the fifth of seven children to the 10th Duke, and as a second son, took up a career in land management after taking a degree in history from Oxford University. When his older brother Harry died in 1995, Rafe took on the leadership of the Northumberland Estates with its magnificent seats, Annick Castle and Zion House on the outskirts of London. And over the years in his quiet and sure-handed way, Rafe has turned Northumberland Estates into a thriving enterprise, multifaceted with diverse interests in property, farming, forestry, and tourism. The estate together with the castle and Annick Gardens, which the Duchess created, employs more than 300 staff directly and generates more than 30 million pounds per year for the local economy from visitors alone. Rafe's interest in conservation encompassed the art, architecture and archives of the castle, as well as the parks, woods and farms of the estate. Rafe's new book, The Lions of the North, tells the human story of his family's history and Annick Castle with wit and flair, from imprisonments, battles, executions, and murders to the more peaceful challenges of visitor attractions and balance sheets. As Dan Snow put it in the foreword to the book, the story of Annick is the story of England. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. To many people, the idea of a Norman family still living in a castle that they acquired over 700 years ago seems anachronistic, strange, uh, and maybe even wrong. After all, the victory of parliamentary democracy after civil war and the world wars, social upheavals and punitive tax regimes of the 20th century destroyed many great fortunes and ruined many great houses. And apart from those destroyed by warfare, many were flattened by their impoverished owners to end the heavy drain on dwindling resources. Others were given to the nation whilst their owners remained as tenants. And throughout Europe, great houses were consigned to gradual ruination by the Napoleonic Code. So how has Annick Castle and the Percy family survived? what part have they played in history, and what is their relevance now? As we know, a Saxon modern Bailey castle probably stood on the present site before the Norman conquest, and it was held by a Saxon lord called Gisbright Tyson, whose son William was killed at Hastings. William Tyson's daughter was granted by William the Conqueror in marriage to a Norman knight, Ivo de Vesey, who secured ownership of the castle and barony of Annick and his family held it for the next 230 years before another Norman family, the de Percy's, acquired it. The de Vesey and de Percy histories converged at significant points over this period, and both battled Scots, rebelled against the crown, fought in the Crusades, and played important roles in the complex politics of the period. Both families epitomised the superior martial spirit of the Normans during this period. Ivo de Vesey built the earlier stone parts of the castle in the early 12th century, some of which survive to this day. And for the next two centuries, his family enhanced the fortifications and their own wealth and position, constantly fighting the Scots or rebelling against the crown. 
Following generations completed the construction by the middle of the 12th century, including the principal remaining feature of the Norman period, the arch leading into the inner ward or courtyard. The castle's footprint has changed little since then, taking the form of a circular keep composed of a series of towers enclosing a courtyard, with two outer courts or baileys. It was one of the first Norman castles to take this shape rather than that of a simple square keep surrounded by a walled enclosure. The de Vessis not only built Annick Castle, but two monasteries within the park at Annick, including the 13th century Carmelite Halm Priory, both of which were dissolved by Henry VIII. As mentioned, the de Vessis didn't limit their fighting to Scotsmen. They rebelled against King John and against Henry III, but managed to retain Annick until William de Vessi died in 1297, leaving an illegitimate heir during whose minority, or childhood, the castle and estates were placed in trust with Anthony Beck, the warrior Bishop of Durham. On the 19th of November 1309, with the blessing of King Edward II, the bishop sold them to Henry de Percy. As the de Vessi star was waning, the Percy one was still rising. The de Percys, like most Norman families, were descendants of Danish raiders. William de Percy had ambitions beyond the little Norman village of his birth, and probably emigrated to England before the Norman conquest, encouraged by Edward the Confessor's welcome to Norman settlers. It is likely, but not certain, that he fought at Hastings, and he certainly took part in the harrowing of the North, the brutal repression of a Northern rebellion, aided by Danes, which ended with the slaughter of much of the local population and a subsequent long-lasting dereliction. He followed the king's disaffected elder brother, Duke Robert of Normandy, to the Holy Land on the First Crusade, but died of thirst and sickness at Mount Joy within sight of Jerusalem. His heart was brought back and buried in his beloved Whitby Abbey, which he had recently rebuilt after its sacking by Danes. Over the next two centuries, the Percys increased their wealth and power through war and marriage. Here a Percy heiress, Agnes, marries Jocelyn de Louvain around 1150, bringing further estates in Sussex, Yorkshire and Cumberland into the family. However, they remained fairly lowly barons, with little chance of ascending the feudal scale in their Yorkshire homeland. In the late 13th century, Henry Percy III had greater ambitions. He married Eleanor, daughter of the Earl of Arundel, adopted the Lion of Levain as the family's main heraldic symbol, proved himself in battle against revolting Welshmen, and became one of Edward I's principal generals in the Scottish wars that erupted in 1296. Henry Percy was knighted at the Siege of Berwick and became one of Edward's most trusted commanders. He fought at Falkirk, where William Wallace was crushed, and was elevated to the peerage the following year, becoming the first Lord Percy. During a lull in hostilities in 1309, he took the ambitious step of purchasing Annick Castle and its baronies from the Bishop Beck. This first Lord Percy rebuilt most of the towers around the curtain walls at Annick, and probably started building the Barbican, the massive fortified gateway to the north. This draw well in the inner courtyard also dates from around that time. He died in 1314 and is buried at Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire, but Eleanor, his wife, survived to 1328 and is buried in Beverley Minster under an amazing stone canopy. It is beautifully carved with traces of the original paintwork. The next Lord Percy, another Henry, was probably involved in Edward II's brutal assassination, battled the Scots and the French, fighting under the Black Prince, and he was rewarded by Edward III with more lands, including the Barony of Walkworth, together with its castle on the banks of the River Coquit. He added the two octagonal towers to Annick, on either side of the entrance to the main keep, in 1350, paid for with ransom money for Scottish prisoners taken at the Battle of Neville's Cross. A stone shield above the entrance commemorates a visit by Edward III in 1335, while stone figures were added to the battlements to confuse the enemy. The ambitious Percys continued to rise up the hierarchy, and Henry, the fourth Lord Percy of Annick, distinguished himself in battle against the French, and officiated as Marshal of England at Richard II's coronation in 1377, when he was created Earl of Northumberland. His elder son was the famous Harry Hotspur, 
who won his spurs at the Siege of Berwick at the age of 13. When not fighting the Scots or the French, the Percys, now at the zenith of their power, played increasingly important political roles, notably forcing the removal of Richard II in favour of Henry IV. Then I'm afraid it all went wrong. They fell out with the king, principally over money owed to them, after a costly campaign on the Scottish border. This letter is one of several from Hotspur, imploring the king to repay money owed to him, or else. In 1403, with no satisfaction from the king, the Percys rose in revolt. Hotspur was killed in the resulting Battle of Shrewsbury, not by Prince Hal, as in Shakespeare's Henry IV Part I, but by an arrow shot into his eye as he opened his visor to get a better view of the raging conflict. With that, the battle was lost, and Henry's, Henry Hotspur's widow fled to Scotland with their young son, Henry. The old earl was defeated and killed at Bramham Moor in 1408, and with that the once powerful Percys were reduced to a few noble heads and limbs rotting on spikes over the gates of London and other cities. Their titles removed, estates confiscated, the family's destruction absolute, but for one enormous piece of luck. Hotspur's young son Henry was now living under the protection of the Scottish king Robert III. This monarch's son and young Henry Percy were sent to be schooled in France, but on the way privateers captured their boat in the Channel and sent the boys to the English king, where, to cut a long story short, the young Percy got to know the Prince of Wales, who became Henry V on the death of his father in 1413. In 1416, he restored much of the family's honours and titles to the young Percy and made him General Warden of the Marches, responsible for overseeing law and order on the Scottish border. Unfortunately, Henry V's untimely death in 1422 and the ensuing political stresses created during the minority of his infant, mentally troubled heir, Henry VI, and this new king's weaknesses and failures once his majority was attained, particularly the loss of virtually all French lands, gradually brought England to the verge of anarchy. A rumbling feud between the Percys and their northern rivals, the Nevilles, created a spark that helped to ignite the Wars of the Roses between the rightful, if useless, Lancastrian King Henry and the ambitious Richard, Duke of York. Upholding the Lancastrian cause, the second Earl of Northumberland was ruthlessly slain in the First Battle of St Albans in 1455 on the orders of Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. His sons, Henry, Third Earl, and Sir Richard Percy were killed leading the vanguard in a storm of snow and arrows at Towton in 1461, the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil. Sir Thomas Percy, Lord Egremont, was killed at the Battle of Northampton, trying to protect the king, and Sir Rafe Percy famously died, deserted by his allies, in a heroic last stand at the Battle of Hedgeley Moor in Northumberland. The Earl's son, Henry, was committed to the Tower of London by the victorious Edward IV, and the Percys were in trouble once more. The estates were confiscated, and the earldom bestowed on John Neville, Lord Montague, brother of Warwick the Kingmaker, and victor over Rafe Percy at Hedgeley Moor. After Titan, Queen Margaret launched campaigns against the Yorkists from Scotland, and their armies fought back and forth across Northumberland. And Annick Castle changed hands five times by 1464, when the Lancastrian cause was crushed at the Battle of Hexham. Warwick and his faction took charge of Annick, but in the years that followed, his treachery caused Edward IV to bring the Percys back from the brink and restore the young Henry Percy to his estates and titles in order to create a buffer against Warwick. The fourth Earl of Northumberland was thereafter loyal to Edward, and after Edward's death in 1483, he appeared equally loyal to Edward's brother Richard, who usurped the throne after the murder of Edward's two sons. The Earl had fought with Richard on the border, notably bringing Berwick finally back into English hands in 1482. And this watchtower at Harn Priory was built by him around this time to warn of marauding Scots and protect the monks. At the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, the Earl of Northumberland helped to bring the Plantagenet dynasty to an end by failing to engage his forces at the critical moment when Richard III charged at the seemingly ill-protected Henry Tudor. Without Northumberland's support, the king's defeat and death were inevitable. After initial mistrust, Henry VII bestowed his favour on the Earl, but in 1489, 
whilst trying to collect taxes for his new master, the Earl was murdered by an angry mob near York, either as revenge for his apparent treachery at Bosworth, or simply as a furious reaction to excessive taxation by an impoverished population. He was buried in Beverley Minster, attended by 500 priests and 13,340 poor people, most of whom were paid to attend. The Tudor period was no more peaceful for the Percys. The fifth Earl, the first to die of natural causes, saw himself as a Renaissance prince at the court of Henry VIII and squandered much of the family wealth. He was fighting in France when the Scots invaded and were crushed at Flodden in 1513, although other family members took part and brought local archers to the fray. This parchment lists the Earl's bowmen who fought at Flodden, many Annick names amongst them. We know quite a lot about the castle at this time, from surveys done in the 16th century. There was an exchequer, a courthouse, stabling for 160 horses, a prison, a bakery, and you can still see the smoke stains on the walls, and a brewery, slaughterhouse and chapel. There were 166 members of the domestic establishment, including a dean, 10 priests and 17 choristers. From the archives we also know the castle's routine and what the family ate. The children, for instance, had six servants waiting on them at meals, and their breakfast was a loaf of bread, a quart of wheat beer, and three boiled mutton bones. The next and sixth Earl fell in love as a young man with Anne Boleyn, but was forced by his father and Cardinal Wolsey to give her up, as she wasn't quite posh enough. This prayer book was a gift to her from the King, and later acquired by one of my predecessors. The Earl spent much of his life fighting the Scots in the wild border country, but his two brothers rebelled against the king and his reformation in the Pilgrimage of Grace, and the earl died in misery and debt the day after his brother Thomas was hanged, drawn and quartered at Tyburn. With no heir except the Catholic son of his savagely executed brother, the crown took charge of Annick, which was then occupied by successive wardens of the Eastern Marches. On Mary Tudor's accession, however, Percy fortunes improved once more. The Catholic Queen restored the titles and estates to Thomas Percy, and things looked rosy for a while. Then Mary went and died, and although the Protestant Elizabeth was initially tolerant towards Catholics, she became the target of plots in favour of her Catholic cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. William Cecil, Elizabeth's loyal and cunning adviser, mistrusted the Earl, and goaded him into rebellion with the Earl of Westmoreland in 1569. This rising of the Northern Earls failed dismally, and the Earl was beheaded in York for treason. This is his death warrant, signed by the Queen herself. His brother Henry, the Eighth Earl, inherited the estates and titles, but Cecil didn't trust him either. And during his third stint in the Tower of London in 1584, he was found shot through the heart in his cell, almost certainly murdered on Cecil's orders. His son, the Ninth Earl, was similarly tainted with suspicion, but he helped in James I's peaceful accession to the throne and was rewarded with the freehold of Zion House in Middlesex, which he had previously leased from the Crown. All should have been well, but increasing royal intolerance towards Catholicism led to the gunpowder plot the following year, and the Earl's fervently Catholic cousin, Thomas Percy, was one of the conspirators. The Earl was implicated in the plot, was heavily fined and spent the next 16 years in the Tower of London, studying alchemy, among other things, and waiting to be hauled out to the executioner's block at any moment. However, he survived and was eventually released. His son, the 10th Earl, was made Lord High Admiral by Charles I, but his support for the parliamentarian cause made this untenable, and he was relieved of his position as civil war loomed. His sister, Lucy Hay, Countess of Carlisle, had a colourful career as mistress to senior figures on both sides of the political divide, including Buckingham, Stratford and Pym, and as a mischievous double agent. She also plotted with Cardinal Richelieu to expose her former lover Buckingham's affair with the French Queen, and she was, apparently, the inspiration for Milady de Winter, the femme fatale in Alexandre Dumas's Three Musketeers. In 1670, the earldom that had survived wars and executions for nearly 300 years was ironically extinguished by a microorganism when the 25-year-old 11th Earl died of a brief illness while touring Italy. The estates and barony passed to his infant daughter, Elizabeth, on whose tiny shoulders the future of Annick and the Percys rested. 
She was quite a catch and was married three times before the age of 15. First as a child to Lord Ogle, who died soon after. Then to Thomas Thin of Longleat, a wealthy and unpleasant cad, who kidnapped and abused her and forced her to marry him. He was murdered by a rival for her, for her affections and ended up, uh, and she ended up marrying the sixth Duke of Somerset, who was known as the Proud Duke on account of his extreme pomposity. His son, the seventh Duke of Somerset, inherited the Percy barony and estates from his mother. And despite its poor condition, after all it had been ravaged by war, the billeting of Cromwellian troops and the passing of armies, and it had been neglected for many years. But he spent many happy summers at Annick with his family, instilling a passion for Northumberland in the mind of his young daughter Elizabeth, who became his heir after the death of her brother. This lady Elizabeth Seymour had married a Yorkshire baronet, Sir Hugh Smithson, in 1740, and they took on the Percy name. Sir Hugh was elevated to Earl and later made Duke of Northumberland, the only dukedom created in George III's long reign, in recognition for friendship and political support. This gilded couple decided to make Annick their principal home and, as luck would have it, vast resources became available through improvements in agriculture and the demand for coal. They embarked on the complete restoration of Annick, hiring, among other things, uh, among other people, the great Scottish architect Robert Adam to create their perfect home and Capability Brown to mould a suitably ideal landscape. This was now an era when peace, at least in England, was the normal state of affairs, as opposed to previous generations who saw normality in conflict. For the family, it was an era of wealth, not from plunder or ransom of prisoners, but from farming, mining and commerce. It was an age of growth and culture and benevolence. And with her husband, Elizabeth brought life back to Annick and created a new dynasty. Brisley Tower in Hulm Park stands as her principal memorial, commissioned by her husband and built by Robert Adam, overlooking North Northumberland, the Capability Brown landscape and Annick Castle, which they had together recreated. Their son, the second Duke, was a warrior who served with distinction in the American War of Independence, famously saving the British force from annihilation after Lexington, marching them back to Charlestown and fending off the New England militia who harried their retreat. And in the latter part of the 18th century, as Duke, he created a tenantry volunteer force to help repel Napoleon if he invaded along the Northumbrian coast. And these are some of the weapons issued to this force, now displayed in the front hall at Annick, mostly in perfect working order. The second Duke had a half-brother, James Smithson, the first Duke's illegitimate son, who, in a roundabout way, left a large sum of money to the American government and thereby founded the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. But that's another long story. The third Duke had political ambitions and, particularly relevant at the moment, in his maiden speech in the House of Commons, he advocated the complete abolition of slavery, thereby exceeding Wilberforce's less ambitious drive to abolish just the slave trade and not slavery itself. He was a philanthropist and a passionate but botanist, but it was his brother, Algernon, the fourth Duke, who made the castle what it is today. He had a distinguished naval career and travelled widely in Europe, Africa and the Middle East and had vast wealth, much of which came from his coal mines. Disliking Adam's creation, he brought in Ante Selvin to rebuild the castle, keep, around the massive Prudhoe Tower. And he brought in Italian artists, designers and craftsmen. Schools of wood carving, plaster work and drawing were created with skilled Italian tutors. And for two decades, this massive project created a vast employment and education initiative. He embellished his creation with greater art, including the collection of the Italian Camuccini brothers, who had acquired 74 mainly Renaissance paintings from noble Italian families. Paintings by Raphael, Claude, Lotto, Del Sarto, Bellini and others. This new collection fitted seamlessly into the notable collections of previous incumbents particularly the Ninth Earl's Library and the Tenth Earl's collection of Van Dyck's and Lely's, including several of the royal family that he commissioned. He acquired part of the collection of the Duke of Buckingham, his sister's former lover, after his assassination in 1628, including this Titian of the Bishop of Armagnac and his secretary. The fourth Duke died in 1865 before his castle was completed, 
and he was succeeded for a couple of years only by his cousin George, the 87-year-old second Earl of Beverley, whose younger son Henry had won a Victoria Cross in the Crimea. His eldest son, Algernon, the sixth Duke, completed the fourth Duke's work and commissioned and bought furniture for the state rooms. His son, the seventh Duke, added a tower to the outer walls and added coach houses on either side of the archway leading into the stable yard. And as the 19th century came to a close, the household staff numbered 86, of which 39 were women and 47 men. We think of the castle being busy now with a handful of staff, but it must have been an extraordinary bustling hive of activity in those years. The seventh Duke had 13 children, six of whom died young, including Henry, a budding politician who died suddenly of pleurisy or pneumonia in Paris in 1910. His younger brother, Alan, my grandfather, inherited in 1918. He had a distinguished military career in South Africa, Sudan and France until 1916, when he joined the intelligence department at the War Office. After the war, the threat that socialism and worse, Bolshevism, posed to everything he believed in and had fought to protect, dictated his strongly right-wing political attitude, which he expressed in the House of Lords and in two newspapers, the Morning Post, in which he had a shareholding, and the Patriot, which he owned. And he vigorously defended his significant ownership of coal-bearing lands, helping to stave off nationalisation until 1942, 12 years after his sudden death at the age of 50. My uncle George was 18 when he inherited the dukedom, but 10 years later, after helping to save the life of a fellow officer, he was killed by German machine gun fire in Belgium, serving with the Grenadier Guards. His younger brother, my father, the 10th Duke, fought in the Western Desert and Greece before serving in the War Office, while my mother served in the Navy, dodging U-boats and decoding enemy radio traffic. They married in 1946 and faced the task of restoring and modernising the castle and estate after wartime neglect. Heavy taxation and coal nationalisation, combined with minimal investment, had decimated the revenue stream, so my father set about the gradual improvement of his rural assets, particularly farming and forestry. He threw himself into post-war local politics and also chaired the committee investigating the 1967 outbreak of foot and mouth disease most of which was rashly ignored in the last outbreak. He was a Knight of the Garter, Lord Lieutenant and Chancellor of Newcastle University, in which capacity he conferred an honorary degree on Dr Martin Luther King, a year before King's assassination. My father died in 1988 and my older brother Harry lived mainly at Zion, where he followed his passion for the film world, and sadly died there in 1995, aged only 42. My wife, Jane, and I have been trying to build on the work of our predecessors ever since. Jane took on the role of Lord Lieutenant a few years ago and puts much of her energy into the Annick Garden project, which has been a great success, bringing several hundred thousands of people to the region and contributing greatly to the local economy, as well as providing considerable charitable benefit in the area. We have restored much of the castle and other heritage assets and liabilities and invested heavily in the castle attractions trying to make the most of its historic and cultural assets, as well as its role as Hogwarts in Harry Potter and its prominence in various other TV shows and films, such as Blackadder, Downton Abbey, Robin Hood and a few others. We now get over 300,000 people around the castle in each seven-month season. In the heady days when revenue from coal was vast, taxation was low and labour was cheap, estates like Annick supported a vast army of people. I've mentioned the number employed in the castle at the end of the 19th century, but every farm would support several families. Forestry, fishing, hunting, building, maintenance, horticulture, estate management. Every department was part of the machinery that kept the estate going and thriving, supporting families and communities. Punitive taxation, particularly death taxes, and the re removal of the principal source of revenue through coal nationalisation, certainly helped to squeeze the rich until the pips squeaked but it also drastically reduced my family's ability to provide employment and maintain the heritage for which we were responsible. And by the mid-1970s, my father was seriously considering moving out of the castle and into a more user-friendly home. Thankfully, more recent governments have recognised that it may be preferable to have that heritage maintained by owners whose systems have evolved over generations. And here is an old picture of our estate office staff with an ability and passion to protect, protect and preserve, rather than depend on state-controlled bodies and committees to do that job, 
often at great expense to the taxpayer. And we have benefited from a less aggressive fiscal policy that allows that to happen. The Northumberland estate still consists of about 100,000 acres, much of it farmland. Some in hand, but most let to around 70 tenant farmers. There is about 8,000 acres of forestry, plus rivers, lakes, quarries, coastline, houses, cottages, offices, sheds, and a wonderful island and bird sanctuary, Coquit Island, managed by the RSPB. Many of these assets provide revenue, but in real terms, traditional estate income streams have diminished significantly, and we have had to develop greater sources of revenue, investing in and building commercial property in the UK and overseas. Investment has come principally from the sale of development land, and we have a strong planning and development team based in Newcastle. Without that injection of capital, our ability to maintain this heritage and invest in the future would not be possible. We employ nearly 200 people, not including the Annick Garden employees, and this rises to over 300 in the tourist season. Looking after ancient buildings is only part of our heritage maintenance task. There are over 22,000 heritage objects, from powder horns to ceramics, uniforms, statues, works of art, archaeological pieces and furniture. There are 23,000 printed volumes. Archive material fills two kilometres of shelving, and a third of this is written in medieval Latin. We have a strong collection and archive team that looks after all this, as well as organising ex exhibitions in the castle and elsewhere. Annick Castle is the principal focus for my family and an army of employees, consultants and trustees. Its preservation is an overriding priority. It has seen so much of over the last thousand years, first as a medieval fortress, a huge statement of military might for its Norman lords, and then as a treasure and pleasure house in its late 18th and 19th century reincarnations, showing off the great wealth and aristocratic culture, power and privilege of its incumbents. Annick is still a wonderful home, though not designed for modern families, ageing owners and incontinent dogs. Our ability to continue there depends on the actions of government, the goodwill of visitors and the success of our businesses. But we are lucky to have lived through a relatively benign period, made the most of it and above all had a team of extremely skilled and dedicated people to help us. To them I am eternally grateful. Now I hope I haven't bored you too much with this brief rush through <clears throat> nearly a thousand years of history and if you'd like to learn more about Annick, the estate and the Percy's, I just happened to have written a book called Lions of the North that deals with their story from 1066. It is available through the um, Annick Castle website at a reasonably modest price. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for a really fascinating lecture, Rafe, and you did very well to condense a thousand years of history into such a short period of, of time. So thank you. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of people viewing it. So I'm going to start with uh, the first question from Malcolm. And Malcolm would like to know if you had the opportunity to go back in time to meet one of your ancestors, who would you most like to meet and what would you talk about? It's a really tricky one. Um, I think, I mean, I'd love to meet Harry Hotspur, but I think uh, he was so concerned with bloodshed and medieval politics that I, I don't think I'd get a word in edgeways. I think, I think a more interesting character might have been the fourth Duke of Northumberland who, who rebuilt Annick as it is now. Um, and he had a, a fascinating history. He served in the Navy. Um, and travelled all over all over Europe, and he was a real sort of polymath. So I, I think he'd be the most interesting one. Okay, great. Lee is interested in why some of the Percys are buried in Beverly Minster rather than in a cathedral or minster closer to Annick. Um, yes. Well, we we started our life in Yorkshire. Um, it, it's likely that we came over, or the Percys came over before the Norman Conquest, because Edward the Confessor was was encouraging um, 
immigrants from, from Normandy at that stage. And the reason why we think that was because William de Percy was known to have had a beard and long hair, which was very unlike uh, the Normans who came over with William the Conqueror and the conquest um, at Hastings. So we assume that he had been in, in, he had been in in English society before uh, before William the First. And anyway, Yorkshire was their home. They started off at Topcliffe um, by the present day one, um, and Beverly was was all part of their their domain, as it were. Great. Were you taught about your family history as a child, or is it something that you have become more interested in recently? Um, I think we were, all my family were taught about it as children. Um, my, my grandfather wrote a, a very good little concise um, guidebook to Annick Castle, which included a potted history of the, of the whole family, which I used as my sort of core for, for my book. Um, so we knew a little bit about it, but really I, I'm embarrassed to say how little I did know about it until I really embarked on on my own um, history book and, and I discovered so much more about it. Um, and luckily having having a very good archivist at Annick and people who were interested in it who could tell me about it, um, it became a fascinating, interesting and, and really enjoyable project. I loved it. And I know that you have studied history as an undergraduate in Oxford. And I wonder, did you explore the Percy's then at all? No, sadly, I never, I never encountered medieval history at Oxford, strangely. Um, it was all modern um, or, or European. So, because of it, I think. We have a question here from Rosie who would like to ask you about the role and importance of the Percy women, particularly with regard to Hotspur's wife and mother. Uh, interesting. Um, I, I regret that I don't know an awful lot about the early Percy women. Um, I know that she, Hotspur called her Kate, I think her name was Elizabeth, and she she really saved the family by taking her young son Henry off to Scotland um, as the as the Percy Rebellion failed at, at the Battle of Shrewsbury. Um, and it was it was there that uh, he became the young Henry Percy became a friend of of the King of Scotland's son, and they went off to France to be educated there. They were captured by privateers on the way across the Channel, and they ended up back at the court of Henry IV, the English king, um, where uh, Henry Percy became a friend of um, the young Prince of Wales. So Elizabeth actually uh, played an enormous part in, in saving the Percys at that stage. Um, as for Hotspur's mother, I really regret that I, I don't know enough about it to be able to give you any sensible answer. I apologise. <laughs> well, there's plenty in there. So we have a question here from Sean, who um, talks about the really interesting and important history of Annick Castle and the Percys. And he's wondering if you'd like to speculate about what the future holds. Um, yes, uh, I think our whole management strategy has been about the future. You know, we, we've been there for so long that our, our management structure has evolved to look to the future and um, that's where we would go. I think, I think we've been quite good at looking after the heritage, um, managing the estates, for the benefit not just of us but for for everybody um all the many people who work on the estate who enjoy living and playing on the estate uh and i don't see why that shouldn't continue um unless there's huge social change uh i i think we we should be able to continue in some form or another um we work very hard to ensure that 
there is the revenue to maintain the heritage. Uh, and at the moment, it, it all looks okay. So give us another few years, I think. Good. There seems to be quite a connection, uh, a French connection with um, the Percys right up to today. And it's interesting even that the, the more recent kind of architectural developments were French. Would, could you comment on that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, as you know, the, the, the Normans were really Scandinavian. Um, the French influence uh, it's probably less strong than the than the Italian influence. I mean, M M Anik, Anik Castle, which was rebuilt in um, in the nineteenth century by Anthony Salvin, is based really on on the classical Italian um, fortresses, which often look medieval from the outside, but were were beautiful um, inside. And and this was a complete departure from from the methods of that time, which was, was definitely, the, the style was going back to, um, to Gothic in many cases. So, so yes, the sort of the French, Italian, Romanesque style was, was much more important than, um, than the actual English style at that time. Thank you. And I think Rafe's connection may have frozen momentarily, but hopefully we will have him back shortly. Jonathan or Umbreen, I don't know if you want to give any techie advice here.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Sorry, have, Sally. No, it's, it's perfectly <laughs> fine. So we have another question here asking you if you would like to say something about the historical importance of Cyan House. Um, yes, certainly. Uh, Zion was built by the the by Protector Somerset, who was um, supposed to be looking after the interests of Edward VI. Um, after he was executed, it was taken over by uh, John Dudley, the uh, who made himself Duke of Northumberland. Uh, no relation to to us lot. Um, he tried to get Lady Jane Grey onto the throne when Edward VI died. Um, and was executed along with her for, for, for his trouble. Um, Zion was then used as a, as a royal palace for the next few years, and it housed um, various people awaiting execution, funnily enough. Uh, it, it was also where Henry VIII's body uh, temporarily sat while he was on his way between um, Westminster I think, and, and Windsor or Hampton Court. Um, and anyway, his, his, his coffin burst at Zion and his juices fell on the floor. I'm sorry, this is um, a bad thing to say just before dinner. But um, it, it fulfilled a prophecy by a Franciscan friar called Peter, who, uh, because, of the, uh, because of Henry VIII's reformation, he, um, he cursed the king and said that his juices would be licked from the floor. Anyway, all that happened at Zion. Um, it then uh, was rented to uh, my family um, and it was given to them, it was given to the ninth Earl by James I uh, for helping his easy transition to the, uh, to the throne. Um, and it's been uh, with the family ever since, so whatever, 400 and whatever odd years, from about, about 1400, sorry, um, 1604, it was given to us. Great, thank you. Steve has asked, uh, Canaletto painted the castle. Did any other famous artists visit Annick? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, for, for a start, we're not sure that Canaletto ever visited the castle um, because he hasn't quite got it right. The, the figures in the foreground uh, on the hillside are, are far too big and slightly out of context. Um, well, we know that Turner visited Annick, uh, and there is a, a picture by Turner from a quite a difficult angle. Um, other than that, there was a Northumbrian artist called T.M. Richardson who, who painted it, and and many lesser well-known artists, but I, I, can't, I can't give you all their names, I'm afraid. Hope that helps. That does help. And the next question is, do you feel a sense of responsibility towards the upkeep of Annick Castle and preserving the cultural heritage? Um, I do very much. Um, I mean, I try not to be completely, um, dominated by that feeling but i have such huge uh, respect for my forebears and all they did um that i would be i would hate to be the one to to let it go so i uh, i do i feel really responsible for trying to maintain what they achieved um protect their legacy and, and protect the heritage um not just for my family but for the nation as a whole. Um, but I, I, mean, I try not to be confined by that history. Um, but there it is. It is partly confining. Wonderful. So thank you very much for an excellent lecture. And I'm sure you'll all join with me saying thank you to the Duke of Northumberland, Rafe Percy. And if, if this was live, you'd be hearing very loud applause now. So I'm afraid you'll just have to imagine what that sounds like virtually. Thank you to our audience for uh, watching. If you have any comments, please email us at public.lectures at newcastle.ac.uk. 
And we hope you can join us next Thursday when Jack Schenker will talk to us about. Now we have your attention, pandemics, protests and politics from below. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.